I'm going to just give a very brief introduction. You know that um, in your folder you have a complete uh, bio for each of them. But uh, let me just introdu introduce each of them. And I believe our time frame is going to be about 10 minutes. If we can um, adhere to 10-minute presentations, we're going to try our best to do that. And, um, and then we will um, receive, as has been said, <laughs> receive questions from the audience and have an opportunity for a rich dialogue, I'm sure. Our, our first presenter is Bishop Carlton Pearson, who is the presiding bishop of over 500 churches and ministries through the Azusa Interdenominational Fellowship of Christian Churches and Ministries um, and pastor of the Higher Dimensions Family Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where he has served for more than 20 years. And we've, we've heard his music, and um, he is a person who brings multiple gifts uh, to the multiple ministries um, that he has uh, produced and participated in, as you can see in your program. Our second presenter is Bishop Yvette Flunder who is Senior Pastor of City, Ref City of Refuge, United Church of Christ, and Presiding Bishop of Refuge Ministries Fellowship, and founder of the City of Refuge Community Church in San Francisco. Uh, she is a graduate of the Pacific School of Religion and has a Doctor of Ministry degree from the San Francisco Theological Seminary. She is the author of a new book, Where the, Ed Where the Edge Gathers, is that right? Where the Edge Gathers, Theology and Homiletics of Radical Inclusivity, and that is publication of Pilgrim Press. Our third presenter is Bishop Andy Luter, who is pastor of the Oakley Baptist Church in Columbus, Ohio, uh, and has uh, been particularly engaged in television ministry and many other um, um, uh, connections. He is a part of the Full Gospel Baptist Church Fellowship and is the uh, state overseer for the state of Ohio and has a seat on the Bishop's Council of the Full Gospel Baptist Church Fellowship. Um, and he will be our third presenter. Um, fourth is the Reverend Dr. Frank Madison Reed III, who is minister of the historic Bethel AME Church in Baltimore and is the fifth generation of his family um, to be a minister in the AME Church. Um, he is a graduate, as is um, uh, Bishop Luter, a graduate of Harvard Divinity School and also has degrees from Yale and from United Theological Seminary in Dayton where he earned a Doctor of Ministry degree. Um, he also um, has made his mark in religious broadcasting um, and has um, also uh, put a particular um, face and name and imagery to uh, neo-Pentecostalism. Our <coughs> fifth and final panelist is the Reverend Eugene Rivers III, who is pastor of the Azusa Christian Community uh, in Dorchester, Massachusetts. And he um, has labored for 30 years, probably more than 30 years, on behalf of the black poor, and um, particularly is known for his leadership of the National Ten Point uh, Leadership Foundation, and, uh, and that work which, of course, has gotten recognition nationwide, and uh, also uh, the Ella J. Baker House um, is a very important venue uh, for intervention and ministry among the youth of Boston. And so in that order, I'm going to invite our uh, panelists to address the topic of reimagining Pentecostalism, uh, beginning with Bishop Pearson. Thank you, Pastor Sanders, Dr. Sanders, Bishop Sanders. Anointed female preacher senders. So. <clears throat> I want to thank the Lord for being here 
Thank the Lord for saving. Sanctify me, fill me with your precious holy. Name. <laughs> and a mighty burning fire. <laughs> I'm through. Right? We can go home after that. Um, it's almost embarrassing that that this this uh, it's wonderful and complimentary, but it's also almost embarrassing that this event uh, did not take place on the ORU campus, where where I uh, was a member of the board for four, 15 years and an alumni, or as uh, Dr. Franklin said uh, at Emory, at our at our Kojic School, um, we always considered. Harvard people to be unsaved and unspiritual. And in fact, we actually said at ORU that we would never want ever our school to ever uh, deteriorate spiritually to where schools like Harvard and Yale and these. Um, <laughs> and we said that with great sincerity and incredible arrogance. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't so aware at that time and never thought I'd ever be invited here of all. And then to meet uh, and hear such brilliant intellectual uh, discussion by African Americans, uh, especially Pentecostals, is is a sort of a eureka for me. You, you all are more familiar with it than I am, but I am. Um, my whole world, I was in a world almost completely dominated by non-black people for a while. I grew up in the Church of God in Christ, as most of the, the more spiritual people here did. <laughs> and, and we not only know holiness, we wrote holiness. We. <laughs> um, yeah, you can't join in. You got to be born. Not born again, just born in. You know. um, yeah. Um, never thought I'd, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd be engaged in such, such brilliant conversation, but I was, for, for the first 18 years of my life, involved almost exclusively in that expression. Then I came to ORU in, in 1971 and got involved pretty heavily in the, the pretty predominantly non-black charismatic world. My best friends were the Oral Roberts and the Hagans and the Copelands and some of these people we present, Joyce Meyer and people like that. And for many, many years, Jack Hayfords and the Averna Tompkins, and we traveled in those circles and uh, didn't have a lot of um, interaction among my own Pentecostal brethren until we started Azusa, and then that kind of started things again uh, when Oral Roberts pr uh, prophesied that he thought that the next great revival would come through and to the black church. We had the discussion in 1986. And um, in fact, we were, we were just having lunch one afternoon and suddenly that we thought it was a spirit of prophecy that came upon him. We jumped and ran to the studio. No preparation, no makeup, anything. we just sat down and recorded it. So we actually have it on, on video. And he wanted to say that then God had been dealing with me about Pentecostalism. I'd been studying the roots, particularly J.W. Seymour. I was conspicuously lonely for um, the, the conspicuous absence, I should say, of African Americans in that circle. I never heard of William Seymour and little about the Church of God in Christ. I introduced Oral Roberts to J. Uh, J. O. Patterson in 1972. We brought him in for African American History Week. And then I accompanied Oral to the convocation to speak the following fall, which I was not allowed to go up on the platform. Um, but, but, uh, and Oral kept trying to get me to come, and I said, no, you don't do that. That'd be like going into the Holy of Holies without permission. You get struck down dead. And they pull you out with a chain or a rope or something. Or beat you out with that same chain. So, um, but then I spoke at that very event the same night, 28 years later. I was a speaker of that same final night. So that was before I became the heretic uh, that I am today. Um, I want to say something about that. Uh, I, I see myself now as a, a, a Pentecostal revisionist, a Pentecostal reformist, I am reviewing, revisiting, and maybe even revising my theology about a lot of things, not just Pentecostalism, but evangelical Christianity overall. The word Pentecost means 50th day, the inference is 50th day after the blood sacrifice, after Passover. So when you come into Pentecost, you're supposed to already be washed, supposedly. Um, what drew the people to Pentecost was not the gibberish. What astounded them and, and bewildered them, as the King James Version says, was that, that they, they understood in their cultural identity what was being discussed. And they were not discussing religion, the works of man. They were discussing the mighty or wonderful 
works of God. Somehow we in religion, particularly evangelical Christianity, have gotten away from the wonderful works of God into the extravagant works of humankind. We have created our own denominations and organizations and doctrines and dogmas and disciplines and, and it's not really about Jesus anymore. It's not about salvation. It's about our way of life. And I was ensconced in that. I was not aware that I had become so arrogantly um, prejudicial and bigoted. I wouldn't use those terms of reference to my position years ago, but since I've come to this revelation, the vicious rejection that I've received, I, I said, have I been that way? Am I reaping what I sow? Was I ever that cold and harsh and distant? And uh, Was I ever that judgmental, evidently? Or I don't think I'd be receiving it to the degree that I have, receiving the the reproach of the pioneer. But here's, I've been speaking in tongues for 46 years, and I'm 52 tomorrow. I was, whatever that is, figured out. Six years old. I've always said five or six years old when I started speaking. But I'm speaking in tongues, I say Bishop Reed, louder today than I ever have in the 46 years that I've been speaking in tongues. And I, what I mean by that is I'm speaking in cultural language and identification. People are hearing and understanding, and they are saying what they said then. What meaneth this? And here's what that term means in Greek. What do you mean this to mean? Why am I understanding? Because I'm not supposed to. I'm not used to cultural rele relevance in religion. You are relating faith to culture in me and in my dialect, in my consciousness. And I am moved. What does this mean? I didn't know it was possible. That was basically what they were asking on the day of Pentecost. They were astounded because they heard them speak in their languages. Now, the Bible never tells us, Jesus never instructed us to get anybody saved. He said, make students or disciples. I've never had so many disciples of Christ who are Jewish and Muslim or Hindu in my life. I've never had conversations, engaging conversations with Hindus or atheists. In fact, the first phone call I got on my on my my phone at church after the newspaper in Tulsa ran the whole um, story, they, I gave them an interview. I didn't know it was going to be front page, me and investments and all that stuff, and uh, and that conservative buckle of the Bible Belt, uh, which has one of the highest mental illness rates in the country, <laughs> <laughs> highest divorce rate, second only to, to uh, Nevada, highest out of wedlock teen uh, pregnancy. Huge same gender loving community in Tulsa, one of the biggest in the country. But yeah, we're the buckle of the Bible Belt, where everybody goes to heaven or hell through us. We're the toll gate keepers, and I've been proudly one of them. But I, 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 like the young man who stood a minute ago and said he's changed. I have changed. I was wrong. I'm saying I was wrong. I'm not saying all of you are. I was wrong in so many things that I preached, so many things that I believed. Not entirely. But I now believe that Jesus is, in fact, the savior of the entire world. And it was T.L. Osborne who said it to me. When you reimagine, can you imagine and do you have faith enough to believe that if in one man, Adam, all men died, that in the second or the last Adam, all men will be made alive? If people die indiscriminately without confessing Adam, if people die because of the curse of Adam, without even necessarily believing in Adam, why cannot the last Adam have the same indiscriminate, automatic, cosmic, Adamic grace and life-changing impact that the first one? The first Adam didn't redeem us. The last Adam did. So why would the last Adam be ineffectual in his redemption? Why would it be exclusive to a few Southern Baptists or a few tongue-talking Pentecostals? So I had to review all that, re revision all that, and now revise it and present it in a way that... I'm going to Moscow. I'm going to, in fact, I just put on the plane Sunday, Monday, a young preacher. I say young, he's my age, and I get younger all the time. <laughs> 52 is not old, and you know it's not old, especially if you're old. <laughs> um, but I put him on a plane from St. Petersburg, Russia. He read about us on the web, came over, spent a, a week discussing and discovering. And their bishops flying into Tulsa every week or, or writing or calling from all over many that come to me as uh, Nicodemus did Jesus by night. So nobody could know that they're at least considering the possibilities that there may be a little truth in the heresy I preach. Um, Paul was called a heretic as well, you know, in, 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 in Acts 24. In fact, 
the only I, the only man in the scripture called a heretic was Paul. So I'm in fairly good 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 company. Um, but it just means choice, and I've choos- chosen to believe that Jesus said, uh, Paul said to Timothy, "We have put our faith in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, and especially those who believe." If he is the Savior, not just for, but of all humankind, but has a special relationship with those who believe, he saves those who believe and those who don't believe. (coughs) Well, somebody said to Paul, and Paul answered it, what if people don't believe? He says, does that nullify? What if some don't have faith? Romans 3, 3, does that nullify or make of none effect the faith of God? Salvation is not a matter between God and man. It's a matter between God and his Christ. That God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Pentecost speaks the language of the good news, the wonderful works of God is that your sins are forgiven, you are reconciled to God, you you are redeemed to God, whether you know it or not, while you were yet sinned, Christ died for us. The the wonderful works of God, which the Pentecostal, first Pentecostal spoke, declared the good news. They didn't create it. They didn't tell people they had to get saved. They were basically evidently saying, you are redeemed, you are forgiven. Thank God. For the blood of Jesus. And they probably quickened a little bit as we do in holiness. Hey, thank you, Chief. But they knew what they were doing. And so my presentation is not so much to impress or depress church folk like, like you. It's to reach the unchurch folk. And those are my new audience. That's who I'm listening to. And I'm thrilled to be a part of that great expression of evangelistic love. I had to write it down because um, I'm a Pentecostal, and if I don't write it down, I'll be up here till sometime tomorrow. <laughs> Praise the Lord, saints! Praise the Lord, Praise the Lord again! Praise the Lord. Hallelujah! Um, I consider myself a neo-Pentecostal, um, without question, and I often refer to myself as a neo-Pentecostal reconciling emerging theologian. Take it home. Because I, am, I have two uh, concomitant streams that run through me all the time, and they run through me simultaneously. One is my Church of God in Christ self, and the other is my UCC self. And my Church of God in Christ self and my UCC self do not get along. And so from whence come wars and fightings. Um, I'm a Pentecostal, uh, Acts 2 and 4 Pentecostal, as versus Acts 2.38 Pentecostal. And my memory of church as a child uh, was wonderful and mystical, full of a sense of belonging to a community, and a community that was special to God because we were more saved, basically, than anyone else was. I recall the standard picture of Bishop Mason that stood at the door of every Church of God in Christ that we had. And I often asked my folks, what is he doing? And my mother said, he's reading Roots. I said, reading Roots. What is reading Roots? And she said, well, he would look at shapes of plants and fruit and vegetables and receive a revelation from God. So as I got a little older, I asked Mama, I said, was Bishop Mason a root reader? She said, yes. We'll talk about that later. And, but y'all know the picture, so you know I'm telling the truth. My grandfather came to California from Texas during the diaspora just before World War II. And he came, he said, by the leading of the Holy Ghost, much to the chagrin, by the way, of my grandmother planted the first Church of God in Christ in San Francisco in the early 1940s. So my experience also includes three years in Lexington, Mississippi, at the Church of God in Christ School at Saints Academy, worshiping at St. Paul, the first Church of God in Christ ever, praying at the house where Bishop Mason lived and where his children were born. I knew the Bible, the whole Bible, 
I have clear answers to all the hard questions about dinosaurs and creation and all that, <laughs> about things present or imminent things, all things eschatological. I knew all things about sex and sexuality, everything that you could do, everything that you couldn't do. I could quote the appropriate passages to back up and prove my point, proof text my way through any conversation. And I was fine until I went to seminary. And I got, I'm going to tell you the truth about me. I got towed back. I mean, deconstructed in ways. And they don't have a class for reconstruction. So you know just about what my Kojic self went through. Amen. Praise the Lord, somebody. Let me get through. So now, quickly, how do we connect the Pentecostal experience in my experience as a pastor and as a bishop of some 50-some churches throughout the United States and Africa? How do we connect the Pentecostal experience we are having to the book of Acts? First of all, we teach Pentecost as a justice movement. And we teach it as a justice movement because the immediate diaspora from the event, you all remember the, the story, the telling in Acts, after everybody got something from the Lord, and 3,000, they went home. I want to say that. The feast was over, the people left, which meant that they went home with their own brand of the infilling before they got acculturated <laughs> into the lives of the folks who preached to them. There is something about the Holy Spirit and the necessity of our being able to receive this baptism, this, this infilling, this outpouring of the Spirit without having to visit upon everyone else exactly what we received when we received it. All right. So my experience, when I went to Africa, I go a lot, when I went to Africa, I was on the bus with some spirit-filled right, spirit people. And one of them said, now when you go in the marketplace, don't buy no masks. Because you don't know what kind of demons you'll be bringing back into your house. And she said it and she spoke in tongues. Don't buy no masks. Don't buy no masks. Holy Ghost told me to tell you because you don't know what you bring in in your house. And I thought to myself, I said, you know, there is a disconnection between how we got it in a sanitized way, if that's okay to say, in this country, and how, it, how the Holy Spirit is falling and reigning in the lives of people who look just like us and live on the continent. Let, let me hurry along. So what would be, and Mercy Odioye, who's a Ghanaian woman theologian, powerful woman, when the folks tried to make her church dress more Western and act more Western to show they had the Holy Ghost, she said, the maker of the church will purify and use it. She said, that's not your job. We can have the Holy Ghost and keep our culture. The nature of the church or the maker of the church will purify and use it. So then I asked myself a couple questions and I'm going to sit down. What would be the radical expression of inclusion today? If Pentecostalism is in fact a justice movement, and if it is true that William Joseph Seymour modeled a opportunity where people came regardless to race, regardless to gender, regardless to economic status, what would be the model of that in this time? Who are the Gentiles among us? What is the present status quo? And then what is the road less traveled? And so our ministry extends to those who are most marginalized by church and society. And I want you to see my thesis before I sit down. Our, the way we practice ministry is we look intentionally for who does the church hate the most. In San Francisco, it's not hard. And somebody said, well, it would be a no-brainer that you would minister to the same gender-loving community. And I said, yes, with great intentionality. And no shame at all in our game about that. But that's a no-brainer. We have gone beyond that to reach for the transgender community. And we meet some 60 or so transgenders at my church every Friday 
who have not felt connected to any church anywhere at any time in their lives. Somebody asked me, how did you come to that? I said, a transgender came to me once who was undocumented and was living with HIV. And she sat down, she was from Paris, and she sat down in my office and she said to me, I have one question for you. She said, will your Jesus have me? My Lord. Changed my life. Not, not to hear me, it changed my life. It's not a question of will my church have you. That's not what she asked me. It wasn't a question of whether my denomination would have her or my theology would contain her. But will my Jesus, do I have a Jesus that will have her? And it led me to say that if my Jesus won't have her, let me, let me close with this. What is the road less traveled for us? What are the current blind spots on the body of Christ? Certainly, same gender loving people, people in recovery, those in the incarcerated population. Yes. Listen, those engaged in the sex industry yes. for sustenance. Yes. There are people that exchange sex for food yes. in the inner city of our cities. Yes. Come on, I'm telling the truth. Yes. And they are people who need some real practical intervention more intervention and less judgment. And, and let me close with this. So we had to be honest about our own reality and the reality of the whole community to help us to build this ministry. And we had to be honest about the way women have been treated, the way same gender loving people have been treated. And we had to tell the truth, the contribution of women in fundraising to raise money for these churches without equal representation is a problem. Amen. My mother and my grandmother both preached. They just didn't call it that. And they didn't get to sit on the front row. They didn't get to sit in the pulpit. And a young man could sit in the pulpit and be one year ordained while my grandmother sat on the floor. So we had to do something about that. The contribution of same gender loving people to music, gospel music. We would have two songs to sing. I'm almost finished. Uh, just, just give me just two seconds, sister. Two songs. Can I tell the truth? Is that all right? And they songs you don't like. I'm telling the truth. And now it's all right if I tell the truth. I ain't scared. So it's important to tell the truth. So we have this risky experiment, which is refuge ministries, and it answers this question. How can we achieve a Pentecostal style of celebration? How can we continue the traditions of welcoming all persons to the table of the Lord? In the, today's context, what does it look like if you could get dead in 06 for being in a, in a pulpit with a white woman? Then I believe that the work of the church now needs to be just as courageous and just as risky and move to the margins where people are feeling alienated from the church and find a way to welcome them to the house of God. Yes. I suppose one of the first questions that I want to raise is um, uh, the 10 minutes yeah. that, 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 that we have been assigned. Uh, um, I, I certainly want to add my voice and echo my sentiments and express my gratitude to all of those persons, Dr. Best, Dr. Uh, Frederick, Brother Milner, and all others who have really assembled this gathering and made it possible and uh, we are certainly in your debt. And speaking for one that comes from the corridors of mainstream ministry and everyday life, uh, there are times when we assume that the academy and members of uh, academia are not only dismissive, but are not interested in what goes on in church on Sunday and Tuesday and Wednesday and, and Friday night. And your, your uh, bringing this gathering about has restored our confidence in the academy. It has encouraged us and it has caused us to, uh, to be proud of our uh, 
educational experiences, and for that, I indeed want to thank you. I, I also, and I, I pray that the clock is not starting yet, but, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, you know any time you invite a Baptist preacher, you know, you have to understand he's a 747, you know, he needs a long runway to get up off the ground, so, 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 so indulge me just a moment. I, I, I suppose I ought to uh, hastily say that I almost missed this opportunity to really participate, be here, and be part of this weekend. Because several weeks ago, when I received a letter and looked in the top left-hand corner of the envelope and saw Harvard Divinity School, I had assumed that somebody from the financial aid office <laughs> No, had finally caught up with me about an outstanding student loan or something, you know. So. Either that or it was from the alumni department and uh, in any event. So, so I want to thank you. I want to thank you and I want to thank my secretary for opening the envelope and uh, <laughs> letting me know it's not, it was not as bad as I thought. Um, I am honored to be uh, sharing with all of those persons who have gone before me and will come after me. Uh, Dr. Frank Madison Reed, as Dr. Sanders uh, listed uh, those items from my uh, profile, uh, leaned over to me and uh, asked, he said, why didn't they include that you were my roommate when I was here uh, at Harvard Divinity School? And, uh, and uh, so I just want to kind of make that, I want to kind of add that to the, <laughs> to the listing. Uh, <laughs> And so those, those were some great days, the uh, mid-70s. In my correspondence with uh, Dr. Frederick, she suggested that I perhaps do two things. Number one, articulate my own personal involvement in the Pentecostal movement. And then secondly, if I would treat and uh, tackle, if you will, this rather uh, colorful term that has uh, created some resonance especially within the corridors of the Baptist communion. And so I have opted to take these 10 minutes to talk to you from the subject, a Baptocostal, fact or fiction? Uh, a a, a Baptocostal. Mm -hmm. uh, fact or fiction? Uh, I'm part of the Full Gospel Baptist Church Fellowship and uh, was part of the um, organizing board of bishops uh, that brought that organization to fruition. And my specific assignment in my dissertation at United Theological Seminary was to create the policy manual and to actually create and establish the verbiage of our theology. And so uh, I wrestled for two and a half years uh, trying to create a dialogue between Wesley on one side and his <clears throat> attitudes of uh, entire sanctification and Christian perfectionism uh, and second work of grace along with uh, the issues of eternal security and Calvinistic predestination. Uh, I wish I could report to you that we had resolved all of those issues. We certainly, <laughs> we, we certainly did not and uh, it is an ongoing dialogue. I'm, I'm going to return to that issue in, in just a second. But, but let me say, in 1895, B.H. Irvin, Irvin was one of our uh, several pioneers that had recently been, the year before, expelled from the mainstream of Methodism. Uh, he was part of a group that was referred to then as Shouting Methodists. And um, uh, in 1895, uh, he branded a new movement uh, that became known as the Holiness Movement. And his uh, particular organization was the Fire Baptized Holiness Organization. The following year, in 1896, a class leader in South Carolina by the name of William Edward Fuller had his own Aldersgate experience. And when he sought definition of that experience from his colleagues and his superiors in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, he was dismissed and told that what had happened to him had not happened to him. As a result, he sought answers elsewhere. And he began to, uh, uh, to search out some explanation for what had happened to him. And he came across some of the re reading material of the National Holiness Movement, but more particularly the Fire Baptized Holiness Association. And he began to correspond with Irvin 
And uh, in 1897, he was invited to their national meeting in Topeka, Kansas. He left South Carolina. He traveled by mule, not horse, but by mule, cross country to Topeka, Kansas, and appeared at this national meeting of holiness who had just been filled with the Holy Ghost. One of the items that always uh, strikes me is how one's religiosity does not necessarily erase their racism. And when William Edward Fuller, a black man, appeared at the meeting of the National Holiness Movement, uh, they discovered that he was a black man. And they were an entirely white organization. And yielding to the prevailing racial attitudes of the time, they decided to accept him, I want you all to hear this, to accept him into the organization, but not into the fellowship. They, they gave him a parcel of land in Greenville and gave him a title that was overseer to your own people. He returned, there were approximately 40 churches in the five baptized, white five baptized church at that time. Uh, he returned to that work, and from 1898 to 1959, he built the colored five baptized holiness movement. He started out with no churches at the time of his death. He had built 850 congregations in the continental United States and West Indies. Uh, he had national receipts that exceeded a million Dollars. The white fire baptized holding this church still had 40 churches. Somebody better hear me up in here. Yeah. <laughs> On his deathbed in 1959, he was approached by the leaders of the fire baptized movement with the suggestion that now they had changed their mind and felt it was time for the two organizations to come together. And of course, the major question was, who going to be bishop? And based upon that answer, the five baptized holding this church remained an independent body and still remains an independent, primarily African-American expression uh, today. In 1947, uh, William Edward Fuller, daughter, uh, went to Spelman College. She met a young man across the way at Morris Brown. <laughs> 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 and, and that Pentecostal princess married that mainstream Baptist preacher. Uh, that, Pentecostal pre that Pentecostal princess was my mother. Amen. And William Edward Fuller was my grandfather. And so uh, I spent my entire life going to a traditional English Baptist singing, uh, hymn singing, church on Sunday morning and then stealing away to a little five baptized holding this church on Sunday night and so and so both of these traditions grew up grew up within me and so I, I, I saw this tension and I saw I saw an evolution even take place in my own home I, I remember I remember these fierce debates between my mother and my paternal grandmother who talked about when God gives you something, he gives it all to you. He, he, he don't need a second chance, he gives it all to you at one time, just one fell swoop. And, and, and I listened to my, my mother try and, 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 and defend her Pentecostal beliefs. This is what I want to say to you. I want to say to you that uh, Pentecostalism in the Baptist church didn't come through the front door. It didn't come through the side door. It didn't come through the back door, but rather it came through the side door. Uh, Daddy made Mama the minister of music. And suddenly, the kind of music that was being sung in church started to change. We, we went from the first and the third beat to a second. You, you understand what I said? <laughs> this antiphonal exchange began to become apparent in the life of this ministry. 
and, and, and then, and, and, and I want you to hear this because what happened next is 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 so typical of what happened in so many Baptist churches. As Baptist choirs sought to be more effective and bring more power to their singing, they were told by musicians and choir directors who had come from Pentecostal circles that if you want to improve, if you want to be more effective, then uh, you need the anointing. You, you need to be baptized by the Holy Ghost. And, and then Thursday night choir rehearsal became a deliverance service and a, and a tarry service. And so it, 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 and so it infiltrated and became, it became real in the life of so many Baptist congregations. Now, 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 now here's what, what you need to understand. There have always been Baptist congregations, for lack of a better word, who've had a Pentecostal style. Hear me. A Pentecostal style of worship. Those congregations always remained on the periphery of the Baptist mainstream communion. They were never allowed to be moderator, state president. They could never run for national office. They couldn't hold major times. But they, they were used to raise money yes. <laughs> and to serve people. Get, get, get Reverend so and so, of course. You know, he, he, can, he, he, he can get with the people. Let me close with this, and I know my time is up. Let me close with this because I, I need to kind of relate this back. The Holiness Pentecostal movement was birthed in the midst of a Baptist distraction. You have heard already today uh, several comments about uh, um, how uh, Bishop Mason was kicked out of the National Baptist Convention. While in principle that is correct, Pragmatically, it's, it's, you, you really need to understand. 1893, there was the tripartite union between the American National Baptist Convention, the Baptist Educational Convention, and the uh, National Foreign Missionary Convention. They came back together in 1895. Elias Camp Morris, uh, in the aftermath of the tripartite union, put together the National Baptist Convention. The keynote speaker that year was Bishop Henry McNeil Turner. There was this rift within the Baptist communion between the cooperatists and the separatists, those who wanted to work with white folk and buy their literature and maintain a relationship with them and those who did not. And in the midst of that, there were some Baptist folk who got the Holy Ghost, wanted to shout, wanted to clap their hands, wanted to be demonstrative in their, in their expression, and they were not allowed to be so. So they were kicked out. Then 100 years later, here come another group of Baptists, still clapping their hands, Still shouting amen, still speaking in tongues, but this time they decided they would not leave the Baptist church. They were going to say amen and stay right there. They were going to shout hallelujah and stay right there. And they became the full gospel Baptist church fellowship. Methodism is taught that you're supposed to do everything on time. <laughs> and so I assumed that my 10 minutes started when I stood up. <laughs> Protocol already having been established. <clears throat> that, that means all the people I should have recognized and called their names, I just called your name. In the eight minutes and 30 seconds that I have left, my assignment is tonight to say to, uh, to you, as we deal with reimagining Pentecostalism, that we're dealing in dangerous and deep water. Because if you reimagine with an untransformed mind, if you reimagine Pentecostalism with a conformed mind, as in Romans 12 and 2, what you will imagine will ultimately be the death of Pentecostalism as we know it. For some that might be good, for some others it may not. And so as I began to reflect on this, 
it hit me, and there's one name I do have to call, Dr. Preston Williams, because it was not my intention to come to Harvard. I'm a Yale graduate. I had a good job at Yale Divinity School. I was looking forward to making $15,000 a year, which was a lot of money at that time. Being on full scholarship, I saw myself getting rich. But I made the mistake of coming to Cambridge, Massachusetts, to St. Paul AME Church. And while there, my father, I preached at 7, my father preached at 11. And at St. Paul AME Church, I experienced the power of the Holy Ghost in such a manner that I ended up at the altar joining the church and determined that I would catch the train or drive from New Haven to Cambridge every Sunday just to be under the power of God. Luckily, the pastor of that, of that, of that church in the six minutes, 30 seconds that I have left, <laughs> the pastor of that church was a graduate of Boston Theological Seminary. His name is Bishop John Richard Bryan. And he was a student of Preston Williams when Dr. Williams taught at Boston University. And he went to, after I joined, he went to Dr. Williams and he said, uh, Dr. Williams, I've got a fine young man. Dr. Williams said, send me uh, his, have him send me his grades and either I'll get him into BU or to Harvard. Coming to Harvard was part of my neo-Pentecostal journey. Yeah, yeah. So in the last five minutes, the title of this pre presentation is The Neo-Pentecostal Challenge, Redigging the Wells of Power. Yeah. The Neo-Pentecostal Challenge, Redigging the Wells of Power. Because before we reimagine Pentecostalism in the 21st century, we need to redig the wells so that we know what the fathers and mothers, the living water that the mothers and fathers tasted before we reimagine a new millennium Pentecostalism. Yeah, yeah. And so in Genesis chapter 26, you will discover that Isaac, it says that there was a famine or a drought in the land, that the water had dried up. But then God says to Isaac, don't go to Egypt. Don't go into the strange land. Stay in the land where the famine is and redig the wells of your father and your mother. What we discover is that when you skip from verse 5 down to verse number 9 in the last three minutes that I have left, what you discover is that when he stayed in Egypt, the Bible says he received a 100-fold blessing. Oh, bless his name. He received a 100-fold blessing. And the Bible says that he prospered and that he was very prosperous. Now, I know that bothers some of us today. But if you're going to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and minister to the marginalized, you're going to need money to buy the food to feed the hungry, clothe the naked. Come on, can we talk in the last two minutes that I have left? And so the Bible says that when he went to redig the wells, that the wells had been stuffed with garbage and trash by the Philistines that envied him. Oh, bless his name. There is a lot of trash in the wells of Pentecostalism that we must dig out and dig through so that we can get to the living water. And every time that Isaac unstopped one of the wells, the enemy would come and stuff it out, stuff it up again. In the last minute and 30 seconds that I have left, when he finally had unstopped the wells, he tapped into a fresh source of water. Now, I don't have time to do this, but I do know that in the Gospel of John, there must be something about wells because we discover that Jesus met a woman by the well. And when he had finished, he was not talking about the water that would come out of the well. He said that you, out of your belly will come water, living waters. What we need... Thank you, Bishop. Rivers of living water. And so today, in my last 30 seconds, before we reimagine Pentecostalism, let us redig the wells of the fathers and mothers of the faith and then reimagine so out of each generation can come rivers of living water. 
And then we will not be walking in judgment of one another because when the rivers of living water flow, all get in the river. thank the Lord for the opportunity to share and following in the circumspect tradition of my predecessor, I'm going to try to stay on time. And I want to come back to and pick up on what the strategic challenges are for the people of Pentecost, those people who are people of prayer and the spirit. And Paul, speaking to the church, says there is a necessity for the church to resist the temptation of relevance. Presenting your body as a living sacrifice and renewing the mind and not being conformed to this world. In each generation, the people of faith are confronted with the theological, ethical, moral, and philosophic challenge to resist conformity, to be transformed so that God would get the glory. So that at this time, we must wrestle with the temptation to reimagine as opposed to recovering a sense of our original vision. Because contained within the history is a revolutionary tradition. There's a revolutionary tradition of holiness. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. You see, holiness was conceived of as a revolutionary practice and a form of oppositional culture. So when Sister Callahan talked about the long dresses, there was actually a political and cultural logic to not showing all your stuff, resisting the Daisy Dukes. Come on, somebody, right? And, and honoring your body as the temple of the Holy Spirit. So that within the conservatism of Pentecost, there was a revolutionary trajectory. But that was missed as we got sophisticated. And the discourse of Pentecostalism underwent a process of bourgeoisification. So that we reimagined, as opposed to recovering, the notion of sanctification and holiness. Somebody talk to me up here today. Oh yeah, doctor. And that process of recovering holiness was part of a deeper epistemological project of resistance and transcendence. 
We were resisting the administrative logic of a corrosive capitalist culture which promoted a culture of death through the reduction and perversion of human sexuality. I'm going to say that again. The cultural logic of advanced capitalism promoted a hedonistic elevation of the created above the creator under the pretext of emancipation, liberation, and alternative lifestyles. So today, We've got a revolutionary project. The revolutionary project consists in at least four areas. There must be a philosophic recovery of biblical thought as the precondition of an emancipatory project which presupposes first, moral order. Then, secondly, freedom to pursue justice. You see, we have come to a point where we have forgotten the, the moral, existential, political, and cultural logic of order as a precondition for the pursuit of freedom and justice. Because within biblical thought, there is order. There's a right way you're supposed to do stuff. Somebody say amen. I know that was hard for y'all. We sit up here in Harvard, and y'all are all very progressive and emancipated and revolutionary, right? So I didn't say something that, that, that messed with you, but I'm going to bring this thing home for a couple of minutes. So I'm going to wrap it up now. Number one, the challenges that exist for the church are first philosophic. There must be, and I want everybody to catch this, a vigorous articulation of a deep and compassionate philosophical anthropology of human sexuality, marriage, and family. There must be a vigorous and compassionate articulation of a philosophical anthropology of sex. What you do it, why you do it, with whom you do it, and what it produces. The family. And you see, this discussion and intellectual and philosophical debate is central to the survival of black people. Number one. Number two, we bring this thing home. We have to have a new politics. The paleoliberal integrationist paradigm of the now obsolete civil rights industry is over. Y'all got as much integration as y'all gonna get. Now, some of you folk, right, are really disappointed. I didn't hear amen. amen. To the truth, y'all got as much integration as y'all going to get. Y'all middle class Negroes. So you know what's going to happen to the poor. What that means then, logically, is that the black church, and in particular, the black church with the fire and the power, will by default operationally function as the provisional government of black America, number one, and number two, be the premier advocacy institution for the black world. Number three, the big challenge, because we have not dealt with this, because it's connected to power, is in the policy arena. The black church, for all of our leadership rhetoric, are policy illiterate. We go to the White House, we meet all the big white people, but in every meeting I've been in at the White House, no one comes in to the meeting with a policy prescriptive agenda around anything. Policy, y'all. Why? Because policy is connected to power. And we in the black church confuse a little cash, a fancy car, the fly suit, the big piece of real estate and the big mortgage with power. God is calling for a whole new outpouring of his spirit. There, is, there now needs to be a fresh anointing. There now needs to be a tough conversation because we must engage in interrogating the new currents and trends. We must recover a more radically biblical, because we ain't talk much about the Bible, 
I've been sitting standing around here for a couple of hours, right? And for all the talk about Pentecost, did nobody say a whole bunch about the word. We must recover a radically biblical understanding of Pentecostal pneumatology so that the connections between the outpouring of the Spirit and the redefinition and reconstruction of economic reality conforms to the likeness and the image of God. And in the process, we will be able to seize the unique historical opportunity that God has bequeathed to the people of the Spirit and prayer. And we will do this to his glory. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank all of our uh, presenters for what I knew would be um, provocative and insightful uh, reflections upon our theme of reimagining. Um, as the uh, moderator, we, I know I see that some of you are writing your questions, but I think that we're going to uh, have the opportunity to let you uh, present your own questions. Uh, but I am going to uh, just uh, take a, a brief privilege as moderator um, to raise. So we've, we've addressed so many different um, topics, but I, I have just a couple of very general questions that I want to present at, at first as we're um, uh, gathering our questions that we will that will um, consume the rest of our time. Um, I have a very broad concern. Um, one is it's based on some of you are familiar with the book I did several years ago, Saints in Exile, where I lift up, lifted up exile as a paradigm. Uh, for the uh, holiness and Pentecostal experience in, uh, in, in, in North America. Uh, but one uh, assumption that I am challenged to revisit as I've listened to the presenters and um, as I've thought through uh, reimagining is whether or not the social character of Pentecostalism in the 21st century is going to be characterized by exile or will it be characterized by a more, um, for lack of a better word, imperialistic or Babylonian form of, of, of Christian social interaction? In other words, I'm asking a question about whether or not even the notion of exile, the dispossessed, the church that is the advocate for the dispossessed, whether that is going to fade away as a 20th century concept, and if what is emerging is um, a, an entirely different self-understanding of the church and its role in society, particularly in the capacity as prophetic advocate and voice. Um, the second um, overarching concern that I wanted to raise is whether or not this reimagined Pentecostalism, and I think we've gotten some wonderful facets of that uh, from our presenters this evening, but will the reimagined Pentecostalism as time goes on, be known and named as something else. In other words, I, I assume that none of us will be here 100 years from now. But 100 years from now will be the, 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 the second centennial of the emergence of Pentecostal movement. Uh, and so 200 years after Azusa Street, will anybody still even be using the term Pentecostal? Uh, we've talked about Pentecostalism, and one or two speakers have talked about Pentecost. But will the reimagined thing melt into something else, or will it morph into something else? Or what is it that Pentecostalism signifies now that we have begun the second century of the movement? And I use that term movement because I think it's very important, movement. For the holiness movement, Pentecostal movement, and maybe what's going on is that it's taken us a hundred years to figure out that movement is not another denomination. But if it's a movement, then that means that it keeps moving, doesn't it? And so I just wanted to kind of throw that out and see if any of our um, 
panelists would like to respond to some of those overarching concerns before we address the specific questions. Yes. Um, I think you're right that part of the discourse here, which is sort of interesting, is that much of much of our discussion I'm, has not necessarily reflected the movement. We've talked about mega churches, we've talked about the preachers, we've talked about big churches. I mean, that's sort of been the thing. And really haven't honed in on the vast majority of Pentecost who are storefront, small and medium sized churches. They're the vast majority of churches that exist. And that movement and its multiplication is moving. And my sense is, Cheryl, that um, there's a new global movement, a new global black movement. I think that there is a Pentecostal Pan-Africanism that is morphing very discreetly in, in various levels of sophistication intellectually and politically. I think it's moving aggressively. It's been beneath the screen and people haven't really caught it. So I think that that's uh, true. And the second point is that I think in some sense for some Pentecostals, one of the operative paradigms, and this is what Bishop Charles Blake's been talking about, is a notion of the black church as Joseph, who was sold into slavery by his brothers, prospered in the land of his captivity, and went back to help his brothers. So one paradigm for some is the idea that the black church may emerge as an institutional version of Joseph to spawn a new Christian Pan-Africanism with networks that Du Bois, Malcolm, and Garvey never could have imagined. Mm -hmm. So that there's a new possibility above and beyond, above and beneath the TV evangelist thing, there's a whole vibrant intellectual movement operating around some new paradigms mm -hmm. that have global conceptions. Right. The most interesting uh, observation I can make about modern Pentecostalism is um, the emergence and emphasis on prosperity, that we now are not the poor ignorant Christians. Uh, I had a conversation with Reverend Ike and had him to preach at the church, and one of the reasons was I had demonized him, was angry with him. Um, and when we started having Azusa, the, the, um, the, our, the Azusa came to town and dropped $10 million on that city. And so the city fathers were calling me saying, don't let it go away. <laughs> he said, we saw you, your people would come in with, mm. with credit cards and getting renting cars and getting hotels and y'all have money. I wanted to make Pentecost pretty. That's why it was ugly. I was ashamed. We rolled and frothed and screamed and my Catholic friends had an ash on their forehead and my mm -hmm. seven dead Venice didn't eat meat. I mean, I had a, a lot of Christian friends that I grew up with, but Pentecost, we were embarrassed. We were poor and ignorant in my day 50 years ago. So Azusa was an expression to jazz it up a little bit, and, and so they came in to St. John's, mm -hmm. but they'd been doing that in Memphis. They, they, they just put them on layaway a little longer in Memphis. Ah! That's right, that's right. But so my white charismatic world, and Oral Roberts said to me, 25% of my income, interesting, he's sitting next to me in an Azusa meeting, and I'm and Bishop, Archbishop Idahosa from Africa is raising money. Right. He can raise right. money. Yes, he, could. <clears throat> he made the command, you're coming down here now and bring a thousand dollars. And boy, Negroes was walking, and they would bring it. <laughs> and Oral Roberts leaned over to me and said, I never dreamed I'd see the day when black people would give like this. Mm -hmm. He said, 25% of my income in, in, in consistently for my whole ministry has been Africans, uh, African Americans, but it's been $10 and $15. I never saw this. So suddenly we have money mm -hmm. and we have Harvard PhD folks. Right. And we're trying to think, but well, we still speak in tongues and we want to invite our, our banker friends to church but we don't want nobody to quicken too much. So we're trying to, right. to, to dignify, as Catherine did, the healing ministry. Mm -hmm. No screaming in her meetings. Mm -hmm. You know, no, no, no wild things. She brought us certain something that Benny is trying to repeat. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and he is doing uh, uh, that. But we wanted to bring this other thing. So we're still trying to figure out how do we keep it dignified and not lose the power? Yeah. How not let the trappings of yeah. success yeah. and money and jets... And I told Reverend Ike, I said, long before Creflo, or long before Fred announced, Fred Price announced that he was getting a million dollars a year, right. driving a Rolls Royce, long before Creflo was preaching, long before these big, big guys were doing this with the money, he was telling us, get out of the ghetto and get into the ghetto, and we said no, right. and got out anyway. Right. 
So we need to celebrate him in one sense. So uh, that's, that's uh, now a Baptist had money, Baptist had schools, Baptist had clinics, Pentecostals didn't, and we still don't. That's true. And, and one of the great leaders, I'll say this and stop, Mother Barry said to me one time, son, when this was back in 1972, I was at the convocation, state convocation in Los Angeles with Bishop Crouch. Mm -hmm. She said, son, when you young people get where we are mm. and see how much money we made <laughs> and don't see any schools and any clinics yep. and any yep. colleges, yep. That's right. you're going to get very angry at us. And she said, Cora Berry was, was, she said, please don't forget us. That's right. And don't leave us. Mm -hmm. I left them, but I didn't forget them. Mm -hmm. and I, but I see something happening, and it's powerful. And that's what Pentecost needs to know. What do we do now? What meaneth this? We have money, so what is that supposed to mean? Right. Right. On, on your first question, I don't think we have to choose between the exile paradigm mm -hmm. and the Babylonian paradigm. Mm -hmm. I think we need both. I think when you look at Daniel and Daniel's response mm -hmm. and look at Daniel 7 mm -hmm. where he talks about it's time for the saints to possess the kingdom. I think that's where we are now. Mm -hmm. But we have to understand both sides of power. All right? When we talk about power, there's spiritual power, prayer, order, worship, evangelism, restoration. But that by itself, that's what helped us to survive in the exile. Now we've got to understand the social side of power, mm -hmm. which is politics, organization, yeah. wealth creation, education, and that will lead to revolution. And so that does not mean we have to choose. But, and if, we were, if we're going to really reimagine uh, Pentecostalism, and this is why whatever disagreements I might have with revolutionary uh, inclusion, one of the things I like is it is broadening the dialogue and it is causing us to think about things we never thought before. But to really reimagine Pentecostalism, we need Bishop Oyedipo at this table. We need Dr. Adeboye at yeah. this table. Yeah. Because it's not so much now African-American Pentecostalism right. shaping Africa mm -hmm. and the third world. Now it is mm -hmm. Nigerian and African Pentecostalism coming to America, mm -hmm. setting up churches that are growing left and right in New York with the Ghanaian churches. Uh, uh, um, um, uh, the Redeemed Church now has over 600 churches here in the United States of America. Most of them, a thousand or over, and they have gone back to the well. Mm -hmm. And when we go back to the well, then we don't have to choose between exile and Babylon because we know that it's a balance. All right. Can yes. I add one thing? Uh, the, what comes up for me is that Pentecostalism is not monolithic. There we go. And I keep hearing it theme, it seems to me, repeated over and over in some ways, that there's one way to do Pentecostalism or one way that it shows up and, it, and it's authentically Pentecostalism. Um, how will it, how will it uh, de demonstrate going forward? I think... The, the sad part about the William Joseph Seymour story is how it ended. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. and, and the thing that we haven't talked a lot about is the tragedy of Azusa. Mm -hmm. How he died, what kind of state he was in, the racism, the misogyny, and all of the things that happened coming out of that revival. That was a, a, there was a tragic ending in a short period of time. How do we not revisit that? Yeah. How can we, how, how can, can we, we not, not repeat? We're talking about going to the well. And which well? Mm. And I'm just saying that it, because my concern is that I'm concerned about the well. Because the way that things ended, they don't have to end like that. That's so true. If we are able to see that the heart and soul of what happened was inclusion, we don't speak in tongues to be different. We don't speak in tongues to be holy. We speak in tongues to be understood. That's right. And to make the message the of message. Jesus of Jesus Christ universal. Relevant. And and we are somewhat myopic about that. I'm in a denomination that's predominantly European American. And and there are people here that know that, that I'm a UCC preacher. And ask the question, how did you get from being a Kojic preacher? To be in a UCC preacher, what was the journey? Well, and I say to them that what attracted me about that church was its justice ministry. I have a lot of Holy Ghost, 
Glory. Hey. I'm like Paul. I speak in tongues probably more than all of you. And sing in tongues and pray in tongues. But it wasn't getting people off crack. Hey. Now, for whatever it's worth, I need to say to you, I'm concerned about economic justice, but we have 28 programs in our ministry that do everything from provide primary care and the pharmacy and housing and take care of children after school. And we just built the Yvette Flunder Community Center and paid $1.8 million to build my God, it, my God. to do services, hands-on. What is the work of Pentecostalism if it is, yes, it is about the spirit, hallelujah. But, but when I get up from praying in tongues, the question that I have, not only am I prospering, because that's not enough. Not only am I teaching you how to work the stock market and teaching you how to invest in mutual funds, but what am I doing to build capacity for poor people to survive and thrive? Yeah. in the neighborhood that I live in. What impact am I having? And I heard a preacher say, who you know, when somebody asked him, what about all the homeless people outside of your church? And he said to them, I didn't make them homeless. On TV, yeah. he said, God knows they're homeless, and God's not doing anything about it. I can't explain to you how that made me feel. But I will say to you this, I believe that Pentecostalism going forward is about taking the same risks that the folks took in 06. I think, we're, I think we are afraid. I think we are way too invested in losing our personal and political positions. So mm. true. I think we are afraid politically within our churches, losing standing and rank. And I say honestly to you that there is a voice crying in the wilderness saying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And the question that I have is how much courage do we have to step out into some stuff that will get us some political baggage and get us in a snip in our organizations and in the places where we connect. And this administration will not like us. And we may not get any of that government money. Now, how are we going to do this big work then? There's a lot of faith. And there's a lot of expecting funds and funding from people who are right-thinking people. And I declare to you, sisters and brothers, there's some right-thinking people out there that will help us to do this work mm. effectively and efficiently. And I see Pentecostalism moving in that direction. Somebody right. said the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous, but there's a few papers you got to fill out. Uh, <laughs> I <I'm laughs> <trying to. laughs> Yes, sir. There's a whole lot of papers you got to fill out. Just as this is, just as we are, the, just as we are the postmodern generation that has established this new term, neo-Pentecostalism, I think that the core beliefs of Pentecostalism are indelibly imprinted into the consciousness of our communities and our ministries and our churches, and that will live forever. I think the way we refer to it will change from generation to generation, and we can expect future generations to exercise the same kind of creativity and imagination to refer to their experiences as we have done in this experience. All right. We're, we're going to go to our audience now. Now, um, we, we have a mic. And, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip you because you asked numerous questions, and I want to get some people who haven't had an opportunity to ask a question, if we can start. Do you mind? Appreciate it. Uh, so could we start on this side? Thank you so much, Brother Ramirez. And, and please keep your questions, please, as brief as you can. Thank you. How you all doing? <laughs> can I say? Um, Dr. Reed and Brother Rivers, um, the uh, pre-electoral season saw the emergence of something called the Apostolic Congress, where oneness Pentecostal leaders were summoned to meet with Karl Rove and um, start the dance. And uh, they, they believed they delivered. And I know there were meetings that were mostly black or mostly Latino clergy with the president. Using the Daniel paradigm, when are we going to see Pentecostal clergy being subpoenaed to go to the White House under protest and going only to deliver the news you have been found wanting 
in the balances and the kingdom's being removed from you. Um, no, I, I won't take that. We will be subpoenaed across the board once we do the homework and really engage the issues. 90% of the time, look, I said it in my presentation, I've been in at least a dozen or more uh, White House meetings over the last five years. When the clergy goes, they don't go with policy, program, agenda ever. And frankly, I mean, as the sister said, they're just thankful to be invited. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm going to tell you the truth. They're just happy to be there. They go there. It's the White House child. They check my ID. It's impressive. You know, you know, I got a picture. I got some silverware in my pocket. I got a little, you know, the whole thing, right? So 90 percent of the, no, 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 more than 99 percent of the time. And, and, and I, you know, I, I don't need to get into names. Every preacher y'all spend lots of time watching TV on is up there. And in the, the, the recent meetings, they recognize that I don't even know why I was here. I'm impressed I was asked. I didn't know what to ask when I got in there. And the, part of what this discussion here should be about, you know, is that yes, people come away with an understanding that if you're going to deal with Pharaoh or Caesar, you've got to approach Pharaoh and Caesar with an agenda. There's got to be something coherent. You just can't be drooling and stumbling over yourself, thankful that you got invited up to the man's house. Because, let me say the last point, what's amazing is that in every meeting, those folk know, you know, we're the richest country on the planet Earth. You know, we almost believe the Earth is ours and the fullness thereof, right? You know, <laughs> we almost believe that, right? Yet, n no one person asked one question about anything. So new leadership has to emerge. Younger people that are policy literate and, and who understand power because for all of our Pentecostal talk, most of us don't have a developed understanding of the demonic nature of principalities and powers as they articulate themselves institutionally. Um, Reverend Rivers, I, I, I just need to ask you a question. I understand your response. But you've been 12 times. What agenda have you taken to the White House? Okay. Good question. Good question. I want to hear your answer. Okay. Every time. No, 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 no. See, no, no, no. You got that. You got that. Every occasion, Cheryl, that I've gone mm -hmm. on this, I've pushed the agenda of AIDS in Africa. Okay. In fact, Cheryl, tell the truth, you were at the first meeting where I raised it. It was in Austin, Texas in 2000. Mm -hmm. And we all sat around there because you know, all, all the preachers are polite. We're all good people, right? And so part of the, the delicate nature of the meeting is that when all the big guys are there, and you got all, you know, the, all the bishops, you know, and use, use, a, use a squidget in a room full of the big guys, there's a protocol you understand. So everybody sort of passes around. But in all the occasions, at the White House when I've gone, and in subsequent real meetings. Because, see, the meeting with the president ain't the real meeting. That's just a dog and pony meeting. I'm just thankful to be there. All of the real work gets done with the specific policy people. Now, the, 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 the more to the point question that should be asked is, okay, what happened in the real meetings? Which is where the real nuts and bolts was raised. And I'll just say this just in terms of results. One of the things that Bush produced as a result of a lot of work that Bishop Blake, using his influence, produced was some of the proposals around increasing the amount of money that would be committed to AIDS and putting AIDS, Africa, and orphans on the agenda. Now, that was driven by the black church and the Holy Ghost people, and that's indisputable. So, you know, so in terms of your question, one, there's the, there's the White House meeting. But with you had man. 12 visits, so is that, is that the one agenda oh, I put issue. 12 visits? 750 million people. I need another uh, 20 more meetings okay. to get that agenda up. All right, I just wanted to. Oh, no, good question. Yes, thank you. My name is John Penton from Tacoma, Washington, pastor of the Roosevelt Heights Church. I'm certainly pleased to be here to hear the uh, dynamics of this meeting. But I would like to make just a brief statement. As we challenge, as we are challenged to involve, is ourselves, your statement leading to a question? Uh, it can be. Well, I mean, we we really okay, want to have is, the panel question, have an opportunity. The question is that the question would be: Have we forgotten our moral responsibility? 
responsibility on the individual front. You know, we certainly want to be involved in a social endeavor, but in order to be greeters instead of gatekeepers, I think we must personify uh, the life of Christ. So therefore, my question would be, where would we have in these type of forums something that will identify us as people that live this, what we talk about, as Bishop uh, uh, Flucker said, uh, Flunder, is that Flunder. it? Flunder said, and concerning reaching people. I think that's the imitators of Christ. So my question is that we are powerful people here because we are uh, the intellectuals and the world is hearing us. And so therefore, we got the mic now. Now, since we got the mic, we have to carry it in our personal life and our lifestyle behavior. So where would we have that? Because Pentecostals was identified by life change. Not so much, they was identified by life expression of worship, but more so the purpose of that was the life change that really identified us. So when we are going to speak of life change? That sounds like a question for me. Um, and just let me say this briefly. Um, first of all, Morality always gets tied back to sex, which always troubles me. Usually, the, it's, we are, so, are sex-aholics, in a sense, even in our thinking. The, the state in the, in, in the United States that has more uh, online pornography than any state in the Union is Utah, per capita, among the Mormons who ain't supposed to be doing nothing. Now, which, which really really gets my goat. And I, I just wanted to put that out there and say that to you while they are picking presidents. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That that's a, you know, because the computers don't lie. So that's an important piece. I want to put that out there. Um, we are, morality is sex. And I need to say just this much to you because uh, the, the idea of family is also not monolithic. It's never been monolithic. That's a, that's a complete farce. We have never had Father Knows Best and Leave It to Beaver families. There's always been some extended something or other, and Auntie and a, a Nanny and Uncle Bubba and Godmother. and Godmother and Big Mama and Other Mama and all that kind of thing happening in our families. And so fa families are constituted in several ways. It's important for me to say that, too, because that's a part of our reality. And finally, I think that um, why can't we attach being moral to things like making sure people are not starving to death? Because that's moral too. And don't come away from here thinking that I don't believe that when people impact Christ that their lives don't change. The problem is we all have a prescription for what that change is supposed to be. And we visit that on people. If this is what's supposed to change. And what changed for you? may not be the same thing that changes for her. It's, it's, it's absolutely true that when Christ impacts our lives, change begins. But as I've said to City of Refuge, you come to Christ and you're smoking five packs of cigarettes a day. And you call me and say that the Spirit of God in you told you to take better care of your body. And that you don't need to smoke five packs of cigarettes a day. And now you smoke three. We're going to shout. Because you came in smoking five, and you got a word from God, and it wasn't punitive, hallelujah, but it was concerned about you and your body. And now you smoke three, I'm going to get you by the hand, we're going to dance, we're going gonna to take the whole church up, somebody here know how I do, we're going to take the whole church up on three packs of cigarettes. <laughs> and if that's the most testimony you ever come in with, we'll just keep dancing on three because something happened. Something transformative happened in their lives. And then in, in, in the broader secular perspective, Pentecostalism isn't necessarily associated with morality. It's, it's, it's associated with spiritual excess. Uh, they think evangelicals are supposed to be the goody two-shoes. Um, I remember I was, uh, Bishop Ray was paying my, me and my wife sending me to a, a resort in Florida, and we stopped at this store to get some things and I saw a little lady, I could tell she was a Pentecostal lady. She and her daughter looked like they'd been in a terry service because the hair was all messed up. And <laughs> the, the, the dress was wrinkled, you know, and stuff like that. It was real late all at night. night. I had preached on Sunday night and flew down there. So it was like 1 o'clock in the morning. So she was walking through the store, and it reminded me of holiness, really, my, my old revival tearing service. And I said to the lady, uh, when I, I, I had my cap on and nobody knew, incognito, I put my... <laughs> 
my, my Cokes and all that stuff. It went out to drinking that kind of stuff on the counter. And I said to the lady, well, how you doing? Uh, how you doing, ma'am? She said, can't nobody do me like Jesus. <laughs> and I remember thinking, did he do that to you? <laughs> she looked like she fell out the ugly tree and hit every branch coming down. But I remember her emphasis was, I'm, we missed, she missed a chance. She didn't know if I was an alcoholic, a drug addict, or whatever. Yeah. When I said, how do you do? That would have been her chance to give me a smile and love me and introduce Jesus to me. And when she said that, I would sing, can't nobody. I sang it for her because she didn't know if I was saved or not. So yeah. uh, we missed the opportunity. We have always been known to be the holiness movement and the sanctified church. But that hasn't gotten us as much. I believe it with all my heart. I live it. But where we are today, and in, this is important for this meeting, uh, especially those of you who, Dr. Frederick, those of you who put this on. I, was, I came here in spirit in 1991 when a preacher walked up to me and offered me $100,000 if I would let him preach at Azusa. And he said, do for me what you did for some others. And I'm not referring to Jake's because I didn't know Jake's in 1991. And um, he gave me $10,000 and walked away. Now, it wasn't for me personally. It went in the office. But I, 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 I was so grieved that I accepted it. Mm. And this was only a few years into the meeting. Now, we were had, had big crowds then. And I went over and said, is this what this meeting is coming to? Because uh, f for him to give me that money that would, and me put him on the stage he'd get a booking that could get him a quarter of a million in one year. Mm -hmm. So offering me $100,000, you know, over to pay incrementally is not, a, a, you know, a, a big investment. Right. But I started saying then the meeting was, and for the rest of the years, the place was packed, the glory of God was everywhere, the singers, the speakers, the ministry was wonderful. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't there. Yeah, I left the meeting in those days. My spirit wasn't even there. Mm -hmm. And I never preached in that conference, and it was mine. Because what the things we're touching on today, from what Bishop Flunder has said and other things that we've discussed, I saw, I wanted to make Pentecost beautiful, but I wanted it to be more powerful, more powerfully impacting. I wanted to touch a world and see a different world. I wanted that Hammond B3, which is yeah. the King James Version of an organ, to be yeah. played <laughs> in the White House. But I wanted to take something, as you've asked these questions, with our holiness, with our sanctification. Mm. It's so much more, mm. and it's not just... Buying your way to another man's house to preach it or, or one night stand like a prostitute or a pimp. I hate that spirit. I think that your question is extremely important for two reasons. One, whether we call ourselves Pentecostal, Pentecostals in transition, Neo Pentecostal, God has given us an opportunity to shape the world. And if we don't stay focused, stay focused on the greatest gift that God gave Pentecostals, which I believe is the gift of power. And God only gives us more power when we show character. And character is not about who you are when people are looking at you. It's who you are when nobody is around. And so if you are a Mormon watching pornography uh, it doesn't make character wrong it means that that person who, do, who says one thing and does another needs to be loved and forgiven so their character can develop and they understand that the more character you have the more power God gives you and so we are looking and I agree with uh, Bishop uh, uh, Pearson on this we need a very healthy Pentecostalism yes. because without it the rubbish will stay in the well yes. mm. the purpose of the well is the water not to worship the well yes. but to get to the water yes. and that water that is in the well comes from many rivers and many streams like and so I, I, I close my comments today there uh, was a football player those of you over 50 will remember the old AFL uh, before it became part of the NFL. And there was a great football player by the name of Abner Haynes. Uh, when I was a child, when I was 10, 11 years old, he played for the Dallas Texans, which became the Kansas City Chiefs. And I met him in 1995. 
And I was just so happy to meet him. He had been retired about 20 years. And he didn't know I was a pastor. So he said, well, what do you do? I said, Doc, I pastor. And he said, Frank, uh, you may know my father. My father was the bishop of the Church of God in Christ years ago. And my brother is now bishop in Dallas. He said, but I don't go to anybody's church. And I said, why? He said, I don't go to anybody's church. Because when I was a little boy and Bishop Mason used to come to the house, he said, I would stay up and sneak out of my room late because I would want to go in and see the bishop in sleeping in a position or snoring in a position where I could make fun of him later on. He said, but every time I'd come to the door at 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, Bishop Mason was on his knees yeah. praying. He said, and when we'd have revival out in the field, and it would be multicultural and multiracial, he said the Ku Klux Klan came one night, yes, and sir. Bishop began to pray. And those of the Ku Klux Klan that didn't leave came in and got saved that night. He said, Frank, the reason that I don't go to anybody's church now is because them old men had power. And when I can find pastors and churches that move in the power of God, then I'll come back to the church because I'm tired, he said, of folk pimping the needs of the people to have their needs met when God's got enough power to meet everybody's wow. needs. Um, I'm Leslie Callahan from the University of Pennsylvania, and um, I, I want to pick up on a theme uh, that uh, Eugene Rivers um, put down in his presentation that nobody has taken up, and that is really, I think, important. Um, but may this is the place where I think our real, we've all been nice all day, and I think this is the place where our real divisions are going to come out, and that's on the Bible. Um, I think... All of us who minister in the church believe the Bible, but what we believe about it is not the same thing. And so I think we need, but part of the problem, now our people don't know the difference half the time. We all holler, we all take a text, we all make use of it, but, but when it comes to our hermeneutics, they don't necessarily know. Um, I think we need to get more... Can you open up the hermeneutics that you use for, for interpreting the Bible? Because I bet all of you are where you are because of your interpretation of a faithful reading of the Bible. Can you tell us something about what it is? I have to get this in. The, 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 that's such a sensitive subject. Because I get, I've been, I got all the, all the Bible bullets anybody can shoot that I've been shot with them. So I'm a guy, I got a bazooka of my own. There, there's a difference between the letter which kills and the logic which, is, which gives life. The Logos, all, most theologians believe in the inerrant, infallible Word of God, which I do not. I believe in that there's, that's the Word of man about God. But the Logos, the logic is infallible and inerrant, but not the printed. There's no, you can no more confine deity to print than you can to portrait. You can't say he's in the letters or the literal, that's what the word comes from. But his logic of love, his language his light and his legacy. That all makes sense. But if we all interpret just the letter, then women should not wear expensive clothes and jewelry. That'll shut Memphis down right there. No expensive clothes, no jewelry, no gold. Doesn't it say that in the New Testament? And no braids. So if you want to become a literalist, you'll, you'll miss the logic of the, of the discussion. So my position is uh, that, the, that, the, that the letter really, the literal really will kill you and it will divide us from now that Jesus comes. Or, or if he doesn't come, <laughs> we go unto him. Um, but the logic is love. And that's simple. And if we could get back to that, that will jazz it up like nothing else. The logic of God is love. I also want to say on that, that I, I think that there is general agreement in terms of what the Bible says. The, 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 the division comes on what it means, and we all bring our own experiences to that. Um, you know, being, being a product of this institution, my, my, my interpretation is not going to be identical with even many of those that I preach to, and so part of my task is bringing them to a level of understanding of biblical interpretation that is reflective of my own perspective as opposed to what they, what they bring with them. You want all of us? Uh, I'm, I'm not a literalist, and I'll say that, you know, I don't, I don't think I could possibly be. 
and be a woman preacher. It's very hard to be a progeny of slaves. I mean, how am I going to do that? <laughs> so I can't, be, I can't be a literalist. I can't take, and, and I also, honestly, sisters and brothers, I grew weary trying to make excuses for Paul. I just got tired of it. I'm going to just be honest with you. You know, and that part about how women can be saved in childbearing and all that. I got so upset with that boy one day I was reading the, reading the Bible. And I read that, and then something just came over me. And I just wanted, wish he could be here. I, like, I'd take him out on the parking lot. <laughs> get some Vaseline, take my rings off. <laughs> and it would be me and him. Because that boy needed counseling. There's some places along the way. He needed some therapy. No, he needed some therapy. He had some, he had some issues because he wanted to be an apostle. And they were rejecting him, and he kept reading his resume over and over again because he was rejected. I understand rejection. I also understand legalism and being a Pharisee, and I've been all that. So I guess to, to some degree, and when you read him chronologically, you can see him grow, just like I grew. Anybody else grow? Oh, yeah. I grew too. So you grow. He, he grew. So if I take him literally at his early points, I'm not giving him a chance to grow. And if he's human and was human, then he grew. I'm human, I grew. So that's why I'm not a literalist. I can't read it that way. I believe, however, that the Holy Spirit interprets to the heart what really is the Word of God. I believe Jesus is the Word of God. W, capital W-O-R-D. Jesus is the Word of God. I believe that the scripture are words about the word, <laughs> but they are words about the word. Beautiful. I do not believe in bibliolatry. I do not believe in worshiping the book. And I know too much about how it was canonized, and so does everybody else that's here. And if you tell the truth, because sometimes we don't tell the people the truth because we need the Bible to proof text the positions we have already taken. Thank you, Jesus. But if we tell people the truth, the truth is... We're going to have some struggle, even with the canonization. We're not pseudopigraphers and apocryphers, and y'all know what I'm talking about. And that's, you know why they picked them? Some of them they didn't pick. And we need to read some of them and know who picked them and why they picked them. And come on now. So this is school, isn't this school? And a frustration for me, sister, is to see scholars. I, it just upsets me. I don't, I don't, I'm not frustrated when prayer warriors tell me that King James is the only real word of God and read it to me and proof text to me from a position. I'm not, that doesn't bother me when prayer warriors and church mothers, and I can walk right with them and love them on through processes. But scholars, scholars. who know what I know, who know the languages like I know them, who learn what I learn, what in the, what are we trying, then I know we're trying to preserve positions. Not true. I, Re Jane, did you want to? On it. Oh. I think, Doctor, your question w is achieving just what you meant it to achieve. <laughs> and and I, I think that's a good thing uh, because, as Margaret J. Wheatley says, uh, as long as we're not talking to one another, uh, we can't be healthy. Uh, I do believe that the Bible is the Word of God. I believe. I do not believe it should be taken literally. I believe it's a nice steak, a nice T-bone steak. And I think the Spirit, <coughs> with prayer, yes. gives yes. us the tools yes. by which we can eat the meat and leave the bone. But I'm not going to throw <laughs> away. Uh, my mama left my father when I was 11 years old. And when we, we got T-bone steak about once every month. But when, and four of us had to eat off of it. And I always waited for the bone because I wasn't going to eat the bone because it would break my teeth. Yes, but I sucked every piece of meat <laughs> off of it that I could. And so I think we have to be careful and make sure. Uh, I've read those other books. I've enjoyed them. I've read Pagels. I've read the Gnostic Gospels. I've read here at uh, 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 HDS. We had to uh, read the book of Maccabees. We had to read the Apocrypha. I enjoyed uh, uh, the novel that's out now that has everybody talking yeah. about uh, 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 the Da Vinci Code. I enjoyed all of that. But at the end of the day, all right, because of prayer, laying the word before God, I know in my experiences, they know in their experience, what works. That's right. And 
I've got to stand on what works. And it's hard enough for me to live the Ten Commandments. I don't need the Ten Commandments and the Apocrypha and the, all it is. It, it's, it's hard enough for me to live by. And that's my answer. I'm with you. See, there exists in the, the academic, uh, their academic discourse on Scripture a, a number of camps. Right. On the one hand, you have the right-wing fundamentalist literalist. Mm -hmm. And in sophisticated circles, we sort of snicker and joke because they're basically those cave people who drag their knuckles on the ground, who move their lips when they read their King James. And that's fine. That's, that's, that's one, the mothers of the church, two, fundamentalist literalists who are all Republicans. They come from the red states, and they have no command of uh, the original languages, they don't read Hebrew, they never heard of Greek, King James is the book. Now, that's one reality, and also one caricature. Because the, the reality is not simply that they're the literalists who are essentially pre-literate people who read their tattered King James and who believe that, you know, God stopped the sun and seven days, no, that, that's, that's, one, that's one perspective it's, it's one framework, and in certain kinds of theological discussions, it's a caricature that serves a polemical point. That's one side. On the other side, because you have the right-wing fundamentals that talk about them liberals that ain't saved and don't know God and that whole thing, right? Then, you know, there is a certain kind of theological liberalism that has a very distinct ideological, political, and cultural pedigree that takes a very dim view of scripture and a very high view of social science and anthropology. And we are in that camp tonight. And that's cool, I ain't mad, right? And so I'll read James Boswell, right? On, John Boswell, thank you, John Boswell, right? Because that's a sacred text and it's important. But this, we, if we're all going to be radically inclusive, Okay, you've got to have the entire range. So it's not a binary opposition of fundamentalist literalists versus the enlightened, sophisticated, radically inclusive. That can't be the game. There is a way of having a privileged high view of scripture as God's revelation that is not literalist, fundamentalist, neolithic, antediluvian, or backward. That, that, right. so I take the bone out and the, the, the word of God becomes the bread of life for faith and practice. Now, part of the real discussion, because this is really the elephant in the room, is this thing about sex. Because see, the two ways the sex thing goes, right? The fundamentalists are preoccupied with sex and truth be told, the left wing is preoccupied with sex. Come on, y'all. See, so on both sides of the game, what's really happening here, and we've been weaving and bobbing and dancing, you understand? There's a sex thing, and what's interesting about this discussion, you understand, is that we really ain't put it on the table. Okay, so, okay, no, so what I'm suggesting, intellectually, no, no, dig it now, is that let's get out of the caricatures that, you know, if you think that fornication is a sin, you basically an antediluvian brickhead Negro who don't know no better, as opposed to the enlightened sophisticated where we deconstruct everything because everything is everything and ain't no such thing as sin or sexual idolatry. Dr. Sanders, I'd like to ask my question. <laughs> and uh, I'm a preacher, so dun dun. You've done that part, so I'd ask that you not preach but answer the question. Um, an anecdote. I made a point about the picture when I gave my presentation and talked about, I think, the reality of this conference is to move to a post-critical yeah. Pentecostalism. But that, that's not around critical. That's through critical. Yeah. Um, when I went to college, and I, I am going to ask a question, quick anecdote. When I went to college, <clears throat> my father, who has two master's degrees and studied for a doctor in education, looked at me six, three hours into a six-hour trip to Morehouse College from North Carolina and said, Marlon, I said, yes, sir. I looked at him, he said, you know what to do. Yeah. 
and that was my sex education. Yeah. This was after my sister had gotten pregnant when I was 13, and she had hit it for six months, and everybody knew she was pregnant. This is after our storefront church had lost most of our members, but we had the largest attendance the Sunday he had to announce she was pregnant. Yeah. My grandmother, his mother, said to me, Marlon, she's a mother in the church, was the first person my mother's father baptized in Jesus' name. She said, Marlon, if you're going to have sex, wear a condom. Mm -hmm. Now, this was the mother of the church. Grandma. Grandmother. My grandmother, mother of the church. And, 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 and so where I want to go here is two, twofold. For, well, threefold. First is, I respect all of the opinions, but I hear from those who weren't raised in the paradox of Pentecost an appreciation for what happens when you get to the water versus those who understood the trash that was in the well in the first place, right? Okay, that's the first thing. So address the paradox, because I'm, I'm happy that I'm baptizing the Holy Ghost too and speaking tongues, but, uh, you know, we got to St. John and folks smoked, they drank, uh, they were shacking, mm -hmm. and they were shouting. So I, I've lived that reality. Um, number two, par number one, paradox. Number two, reclaiming resources. I talked about how I'm reclaiming Bishop Lawson. Pan-Africanism and Pentecostalism is not new. Bishop Blake, with all due respect, has not introduced a new thing. It goes back to the Azusa Street Revival. So how do we reclaim Bishop Smallwood E. Williams, Bishop Ida Robinson, and what work are you all doing to expand the discourse using those resources? And thirdly, and practically, about holiness. The reality is, I meet folk uh, who talk about I'm baptizing the Holy Ghost and, you know, they listen to hip-hop. And that's one of the tragedies in these conversations. We can disagree without being disagreeable. We can disagree without being backhand nasty. And one of the things that caused the major hurt between Martin and Malcolm was the things they said publicly. And then when both of them came to a new revelation, they had to apologize to each other and I hope they met in heaven or wherever because Malcolm died before he could say he was sorry all the way. And now, now you Thank you, brothers. God bless you. A um, couple things. <clears throat> First of all, the, one of the biggest Bible studies I've ever had in my church was a Bible study on sexuality and spirituality because we've set a certain number of ground rules. And by the way, I'm talking about same gender loving people, which is what I discussed um, earlier in my comments. I didn't talk about, I didn't have anything to say anything about sex. That came up later. I was talking about affectional orientation and sexual orientation, which by the way, does not always materialize as sex. That's a different conversation. Uh, my brother was talking about sex. He's been talking about sex. I'm talking about, I talked about orientation. So, um, but I think it's important for you to know that I don't have any fear or, or trepidation to talk about sex. And, and I say this in the context of being a child of the church who lived um, in and out of a bishop's home. And I knew everything about everybody. All the bishops in the church. Everything they did, because they come on the phone all the time. And I had a, it, it was going to do one of two things to me. Either it was going to make me run away from church forever, and because this is the Be Real session, isn't it? It was going to make me run away from church forever, because there are proclivities that exist. All right? I, I have personally ministered to several persons who were connected to the general secretary of the church for a long time. Not the present general secretary, who happens to be my uncle, but the one that preceded him. And many of them have been at my ministry to receive help because the, we were not able to say that he died with AIDS. Hear this. But the people who came to me, who many of them have died, since that time, came to me, and I went to him when nobody was ministering to him on the AIDS ward in Oakland, California, and ministered to him. I know what I'm talking about. 
I'm not sitting here. I'm, forgive me, but I'm not playing about this because, because secrets kill. And the reality of it is there are lots of proclivities underneath the banner of holiness. And I want to say that because what is missing for us is not that we are sick or something. What is missing for us is we are not having a non-punitive discourse about human sexuality. We just keep attacking and attacking and attacking and setting up something that is not everybody's reality. Another preacher came to me and said to me, I'm living with my wife. I have a girlfriend in another city. And I go there often. I wish I could tell you how much counseling. Some of these people in this house know how much counseling I do with preachers and pastors. And he called me and he said, I need to know what to do. Big old, big old church. You know who he was if I called his name. So the reality is not just around same gender loving people. But the reality is we need a non-punitive discourse about human sexuality. Let me something that doesn't condemn anybody, something that doesn't destroy anybody, something that doesn't set a paradigm that everybody has to live up to. And when we have talked healthy, we can then talk about how personal piety will help you to live a life that will not only keep you from having sex when you ought not to, but it'll keep you from eating pork chops when you ought not to. Okay? Is that all right? And too, many, too much fat back. And too much sugar. And fried chicken. And staying up too late and getting up too early. And going to church all the time and not getting no sleep. We'll start talking about the things that make us healthy. But we have to change the conversation. This is not the way to talk about this. You believe this is right. You believe that's right. You read the Bible this way, I read it. We will never, until we sit down and say, we are not going to leave this table or this room until we have talked about all of the possibilities and the ways in which people express themselves intimately. And we do that in a non-punitive way, in a caring way. Because you know what, sweetheart? We don't know what we're talking about. We only know what we've experienced. But we don't know other people's experiences. We don't know how much molestation exists in the church. We don't know how much incest exists in the church. We don't know that the priest of the house sometimes thinks that all of the women are available to him. And the men. Now, we are sexually ill in some ways. And more holiness we have, the sicker we are in that area. Because we're not dealing with it. I have to, I hate to end this discussion. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Please join me in giving this phenomenal panel another hand.